I am often wrong, as many of you guys like to point out and remind me of with frequency. For example, most famously, I initially poo-pooed the iPhone X's abandonment of the home button in favor of a gesture-based navigation system. And while most of my complaints in that video were actually resolved by Apple in future firmware updates, I admit I was far too skeptical about an obviously superior design. I was wrong. I also admit to initially disputing the idea that a haptic touchpad could be any good. I was wrong. They're fantastic. What I'm getting at here is that when I'm wrong, I'll admit it. But when I'm right, <laughs> I'm really freaking right. Listen up, suckers, because I have been prophesying the development and release of in-house Silicon Mac since 2016. I even got the window of the eventual chip's release correct. And when I was questioned, well, what benefits would come from such a transition? Clear back in 2016, I mentioned security, battery, and efficiency. And today, more than four years later, Apple stated these exact benefits from moving to their new M1 processor, the first Apple Silicon system on chip for the Mac. You're welcome. This video is sponsored by Setapp. Setapp is like Netflix, but for Mac apps. With hundreds of applications to choose from, Setapp helps make you your most productive self on both the Mac and on iOS. Sign up today with the link below or stay tuned to later in the video to find out more. In all seriousness, I don't claim to be some bastion of knowledge, and my guess that ARM Max would eventually become a thing wasn't uniquely mine or prophetic back in 2016, even though far more people believed that Apple would actually be capable of such a thing. Regardless, it does not modify how massively important this silicon transition is, not just for Apple, but for computing in general. Because save for smartphones and a couple of integrated Linux systems, the rest of the world runs on x86 chips made by Intel and AMD. And for Apple to just go, eh, an abandoned chip is bold, but it is uniquely within their capabilities as they're now designing their own chips for their own machines running their own operating system. They have complete vertical control of the entire experience, which literally no other computer maker can do or has been able to do for decades. And this will either prove to be a massive breakthrough or a huge disappointment. But based on what we saw today, I tend to believe it's going to be the former. So before we get to the three new Mac models, let's focus on the chip because there is only one that will be in all three of the computers. It's called the M1, and while Apple didn't explicitly state it in the keynote, it's based on the A14, found in this year's earlier iPhones and iPad Air. But unlike many rumors indicated, it is not the same chip. Apple mentioned a 16 billion transistor count, which is about 35% more than the standard A14. So this means a higher core count and probably a higher clock speed. Uh, it's basically like an A14X or Z. But what this means, because it's based on the A14, is that like the A14, it is built on a five nanometer process and manufactured by Taiwan Semiconductor, the same company that makes AMD's Ryzen chips. The most unusual thing about this move is that it uses what's called a POP or package on package design method. This isn't unusual for a smartphone, but it is really weird for a computer. You see, on your average laptop, you get your CPU and your iGPU or dedicated GPU, your system memory, an IO chip. And in the case of Macs, you also get a T2 security chip and a Thunderbolt controller and a lot more, and they're all separate. The M1 chip absorbs all of these chips and their functions into one package by stacking smaller packages on top of and beside each other to make one super package system on chip. Why do this, you ask? Well, there are several advantages. Cost and size are all part of it, but the thing that matters to most of us as consumers is speed and efficiency. When all of these pieces are separate, signals need to go back and forth between the chips, usually through a substrate like a PCB. The signals can travel more efficiently and more quickly when self-contained inside of a singular microchip. Of course, this makes manufacturing said chip significantly more difficult, though Apple seems confident that they can pull it off. Another unique and interesting design decision is a unified memory pool. Unlike more traditional setups that have individual memory stores per component, this new unified memory architecture will allow the components of the SoC to share memory on the fly without having to copy data between separate pools. And this has the side benefit of being easier to program for, but in short, Apple really says that it should just make things feel a lot faster. Unfortunately, we don't yet know what type or what clock speed of memory Apple is using, and frankly, based on how secretive their stuff is, we may never know. 
But this chip has an eight core CPU with four high power cores and four low power cores. While Apple didn't provide any useful graphs, like seriously, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> Not only does it have no chart markers to determine scale, but latest PC laptop chip? What does that even mean? This graph and all others that Apple showed during the keynote are worthless marketing fodder. They are stupid. But let's pretend for just a minute that this is even remotely to scale, okay? That would put latest PC laptop chip at about 35 to 40 watts, which would be characteristic of a multi-threaded AMD Renoir or Intel Tiger Lake SKU under full chip load. Anantex sang praises of the A14 chip found in iPad Air and in iPhone, calling it best in class when it comes to memory management. It has an eight wide decode block and a crazy number of execution units. They state, the fact that the A14 currently competes with the very best top performance designs that x86 vendors have on the market today is just an astonishing feat. And the fact that Apple is able to achieve this in a total device power consumption of five watts, including the SoC, DRAM, and regulators against AMD's 21 watt and Intel's 49 watt package power figures without DRAM or regulation is absolutely mind blowing. Okay, so operating on the assumption that this random unknown chip is a 35 to 40 watt high-end x86 laptop chip, which seems reasonable, frankly, implies that the M1 is getting about a 40% performance improvement over this x86 chip, all while drawing just 40% of the power, 10 watts. That's bananas. And Apple's claim that the M1 has the fastest CPU core on earth may actually be plausible, especially after Apple showed off this eyebrow raising faster than 98% of PC laptop slide. Of course, there are also dissenters like ex-Intel VP Francois Piednoil, who told me that Anantech was off its rocker and just completely wrong. But the long and short of it is, we don't really have any idea how the M1 will perform, and we're not going to know until the machines start shipping next week. Uh, by the way, get subscribed so you don't miss our coverage on that. We have all three of the machines coming. What I am certain of, however, and what we are certain of, is that in most instances, the M1 seems to outperform the Intel chips that Apple was using in prior models while drawing significantly less power. Now, this may not make it the most powerful laptop chip in the world, but they will likely be a noticeable improvement and, frankly, the best case option for most people's use cases. Mac OS Big Sur is a huge catalyst, <laughs> get it, in this transition. The synergy of hardware and software that Apple is known for is only getting more and more tightly woven as the APIs and codecs that Apple releases, if adopted, will become ever more important. With Metal, macOS will be able to provide more graphics memory than ever, allowing Final Cut Pro 10 to be, quote, up to six times faster, they said in the keynote. Rendering a complex timeline up to six times faster. Compared to what? Well, if we look the fine print, baby, we can see that they were talking about a pre-production Mac Mini running the M1 compared to the old 3.6 gigahertz quad-core i3 Mac Mini, both with 16 gigs of RAM and two terabyte SSDs. Now, that two-year-old i3 is hardly a heavyweight in the performance department, but a six times improvement is significant, even with a low-end baseline. Advanced power management in macOS will allow the CPU to use the efficient low power cores when needed for maximum battery life and to only ramp up when performance is requested. Rosetta, the x86 to ARM translation layer that allows us to run our old apps until they're updated seamlessly, is handy. And in some cases, Apple has even said that performance under Rosetta will be even better than on previous Macs running the code natively, which is impressive. Oh, last, you can now run any iPhone or iPad app you want on your Mac without any translation layer, natively, for free. That's amazing. The Mac software catalog just jumped in quality and in quantity. As mentioned earlier, Setup is a subscription service for the Mac, and I had been a paying customer long before they offered to sponsor the channel. Even though Setup has more than 200 of the best Mac apps available for one cheap monthly price, the service really goes beyond a simple list of apps. It makes you more productive. The app is cleverly designed, making it easy to find apps you didn't even know existed. And with personalized recommendations, you'll find yourself improving your workflow subconsciously without having to figure out how to complete every small task. 
Not only is SetApp an exceptional value, I mean, one of the best apps available that I use literally costs more by itself than it does as part of the 200 plus app SetApp suite. But with fixed monthly pricing, you don't have to worry about license keys, wasting time researching if an app is worth its cost and more. With iOS apps as part of the SetApp suite now too, everyone can get in on the fun. Try SetApp today with my link below. I know you'll love it, because I do. So let's finally talk about the new machine, shall we? Uh, first up is the MacBook Air. The form factor is uh, pretty much unchanged, except for the keyboard has interestingly ditched the launch pad and keyboard backlight hotkeys in favor of spotlight, dictation, and do not disturb. In addition to the M1, the laptop gains USB 4, which is based off of Thunderbolt 3, Wi-Fi 6, and it also ditches the fan in the process that, by the way, was never actually connected to the heat pipes, and there were no heat pipes in it at all, so who knows how actually useful it was. <laughs> Go back and watch my hilarious discovery of that a couple of years ago in our MacBook Air teardown. Starting at the same $999 price point, Apple stated that it could edit multiple streams of 4K ProRes video in Final Cut without dropping frames. Pretty impressive. Oh, and a hat tip to the unified memory pool, to be sure. Next up, we have the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Keeping its same $1,299 starting price point, it ditches Intel in favor of the M1, but retains the same battery capacity and touch bar. However, unlike the MacBook Air, it has an active fan and heat pipe system. The implication here, obviously, is that either A, the CPU is higher binned, B, it will be able to have higher base clocks thanks to the active cooling, and or C, it will be able to maintain sustained loads for longer periods of time without temperature concerns. As a consequence, it would be nice if Apple had actually provided real performance metrics from the Pro to the Air, but they didn't. All we know is that they both have the M1. The same M1? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the same performance? Uh, probably not, but by how much? Uh, who knows? Look, benchmarks performed by people like yours truly will finally settle things, but it may be time for Apple to come up with a new system or scale to determine performance. I actually agree with Jonathan Morrison in that clock speed is and always has been a poor metric of performance. And with this new system leveraging macOS Big Sur's software optimization and non-standard hardware, like the onboard neural engine, look, traditional specs just don't matter. This is a weird SoC that can't be measured spec by spec with anything else else. But at least, Apple, give us something so that I can know this Mac is better than this Mac and by this much. Because right now, well, I don't. The only thing we do know, well, Apple said that this machine, the MacBook Pro, can edit 8K ProRes footage in DaVinci Resolve without dropping a single frame. And let me tell you, that is freaking impressive. Why am I impressed? Apple said that was in DaVinci Resolve. And I'm interested because we had a bit of trouble getting solid playback in DaVinci Resolve, editing an 8K file. Now, we weren't using ProRes, we were using DNxHR, but that's a video codec that is very similar in compression to ProRes. And we were doing it on a desktop computer. And not just any desktop computer, but a Ryzen 9 3950X 16-core CPU with a GTX 1080 Ti GPU versus a tiny little 13-inch MacBook with an M1. Oh, mama, that's impressive. Last, we have the Mac Mini that not only adopted the M1 chip, but also lost $100 in price at the same time. And Apple claims it to be one-tenth the size and five times faster than the best-selling PC in its same price range. A massively bold claim. Disappointingly, none of these devices have four USB 4 Thunderbolt 3 ports as the previous Mac Mini and previous MacBook Pro did. My guess is that the M1 only has a single Thunderbolt controller on board because of space and cost limitations, where the previous machines had two. Disappointing to be sure, however, this is still more than enough throughput for most people. Oh, and also no 10 gig as an option on the Mac Mini, not even a paid upgrade. That's really odd and quite frankly, frustrating. For a couple of hundred bucks, you can get a 10 gig NIC that you plug in over Thunderbolt 3, but that'll cut into your throughput that's already halved from the prior Mac Mini. Uh, disappointing. All in all, these machines are still a big mystery. I think we'll find that things are still disappointing yet to come, but I also think that the majority of us, in the majority of circumstances, will be blown away by these systems and their capabilities. If Apple's to be believed, all of these machines are increasing in performance anywhere from two and a half to five times. That is insane, considering that most generation over generation improvements are about 0.2 times improvement. No?
1.2 times, because that's math. Now, this is done all while increasing battery life, decreasing the heat output, and maintaining, or in the case of Mac Mini, lowering the price tag. Wow. Considering that these are also probably the weakest Apple Silicon Macs Apple will ever make, it is super exciting to think about what the future may hold over this upcoming two-year transition, especially for high TDP, high performance Pro Max. So, did you order an Apple Silicon Mac today? If so, let me know which one and why. And if not, I'd also love to hear from you. What's holding you back? Well, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you disliked it, send it to someone you dislike. Thank you so much for watching though, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy. That was kind of like a weird ending, but whatever. No one ever watches that. <laughs>